Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, what I'm interested in as a social meditation is a combination between circling and dialogue. Uh, and if you don't know what circling is, it is a relational meditation where we look at the present moment and comment on what is alive for us in this moment. Um, dialogue in the sense of David Bohm's dialogue is a concept of sitting and talking and seeing what arises in connection with other people and exploring what it is to be in conversation. It's deliberately set without a topic or without a structure other than don't yell at people, cut people off, unless it's like part of the circling sort of experience. So with that instructions, I welcome you to our uh, small circle and invite you to be aware of what you're aware of in this moment and noticing what's alive for you, uh, bring to the group uh, what's going on for you. Oh, I have to say, Elliot, that your shirt is very alive for me. Um, and I quite enjoy the pattern. Um, certainly right now in the room that I'm in, there is a wonderful breeze. I, I'm quite uh, warm after moving a lot of heavy furniture into a truck. Um, and I'm very happy to be on this call right now, so. Mm. Hearing you, Colton, was kind of relieving because my throat was kind of tight and my, like I had something in my gut moving around that some sort of nervousness and that helped with that, I think. I could help you in that way. <laughs> it's also a strange experience watching people rotate through the screen. It's, it's like an, an interesting moment that's forced upon you when you're like, oh, now I'm looking at someone else. Mm. We just got a new dog, and I'm thinking about going for a run with it. He's huge. He's a great dude. So excited. How do you feel about um, wanting to go on a run with the, with your dog? Is that new or normal for you? My housemates, but uh, it's uh, he just moved in, but. I haven't been running much lately. Elliot runs. I tend to lift weights, and I would like to run. Uh, but every time Elliot tries to get me up at 6 a.m., I don't do it. And so there's some guilt associated with it. Um, but also, like, my legs want to move. I feel like I have that feeling of my body telling me that it wants to run. So, yeah. Less of a burden. I identify with that. I've never been a good runner, and uh, I I say on my list that I would like to uh, complete an ultra marathon one day, just to sort of prove to myself that I could. But mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, I know that it's not a priority for me at all, and so I don't know why I say it's on my list. Mm. How do you feel about not knowing why it's on your list? It's a good question. I I think. It is not something that interferes with my regular life, so I, it's not one of those things that I feel the need to investigate deeply. But if I were forced on the spot to say why I do that, it's probably because I enjoy the idea of being someone who has great dreams, whether they are achievable or not. Um, and being the sort of person who proclaims to other people that he has great dreams. Um, and so in a way it is, it is a masturbatory uh, sort of thing that I do in, in which I, I have these grand goals, whether I plan to achieve them or not. 
I feel like I can relate to that. I was looking the other day at a list that I made about a year and a half ago um, of different hobbies that I wanted to get into and things I wanted to accomplish. And I realized that I'd been focusing on the things on the list that I hadn't crossed off. But I was looking and realizing just how many of them I had tackled and how it was really nice starting with a list much longer than time would allow me to fulfill. Um, and like realizing you're not going to cross all of those things off, but I think it also helps you learn about yourself knowing what's on that list and like what kind of people do you associate with running a marathon? Like what, why would that be an accomplishment for you? Um, also, if we all want to hold each other accountable for this, we could do a half marathon in tandem someday. Ooh, I'm on board. I have a friend. Yeah, I have in someone who wants to be seen as a person with great dreams, but I will tell you for free that none of those involve running. <laughs> <laughs> I'll support you. I have a friend, uh, Tim, who is about 60-something now, and he finally, at the age of, in his 60s, gave, gave away his guitar because he had this dream of spending 10 years learning to play the guitar and at some point it re it dawned on him that he doesn't have 10 years to spend playing guitar while also <laughs> having other plans like lifting running all the rest uh, it's like something very hard about giving away a dream uh, absolutely but also something very honest there I just um... thing as well. If it was a dream that you wanted for yourself because the idea of the dream was the thing that was appealing rather than the thing itself, then like mm. you haven't lost much really. And he's giving it to someone who maybe will be able to fulfill that dream. So indirectly fulfilling it. Mm. <laughs> Perhaps. I just started my bachelor's degree and have gotten waves of like for the first time this existential dread of how little time I have because I've never had this experience of learning something new and the more you learn apparently this is a pretty common experience the more you learn the more you learn how much you don't know about yeah it's it's recently brought me to tears of frustration of just this is so interesting but i don't have time to go in as deeply as i want to which is both like i mean it's it's kind of a beautiful feeling but it's also existential dread I, th this question comes up for me of like how do i pick a strategy on the world if i don't have enough time to learn all the things like do i just I guess I just never really fully get geography or never really fully become a mechanic because that's my strategy in the world is to put those down and go for other ones instead. For me, I think there are other ways to approach it. One, you have sort of the brave denial method, which is we'll find a way to live forever and uh, be able to continue our work for as long as we like. Another is to say, I'm going to create the machinery that's going to allow me to multiply my force and my will upon the world by either teaching other people to care about the same memes that I do or by actually creating actual machinery that allows you to increase your leverage, increase the power, um, sort of increase the energy that you can exert upon the universe. Um, and then there's sort of another method which, which is to sort of enlist people uh, to the same cause, not necessarily in the way that you own the meme or that you created the meme, but that you subscribe to whatever version of that meme it is. Um, so I think those are all very exciting concepts for me and they energize me in a lot of ways. It's very pleasant to hear you, Colton, in acknowledging both dreaming capacity and the just the kind of dreaming about how you can assert those things that, that might be limiting. I feel that all of us can relate to this dreaming state that in a way lately became some sort of point of vulnerability. It's not cool in some way to have some grandiose dreams because people burn themselves out for maybe last couple of decades. It was a meme that you don't declare such things. 
it's pleasant to be around people who can declare it with vulnerability. Uh, I have personally kind of lately struggled with this point of multiplying myself. First of all, I have <laughs> for maybe 10 or 15 years problem with believing that we, we, we can get to that transhumanist beauty of singularity and eternity and all of that, although I put a lot of my life in, in that. Uh, and growing a little bit disenchanted with that, getting on the point of acceptance uh, isn't the, the acceptance of death and all of that, even if we live forever. Uh, but more more insidious problem with, with this uh, next step of kind of proliferating your memes and trying to be a part of a big machinery that, that mines information, that, that loves the world and acknowledges the world. Basically, understanding the world better and accepting it or finding connections. It seems that there is always this limitation of point of attention. So even if machinery, whoever it is, nanorobots or brains of other people or simulated universes elsewhere in, in, in whatever dimensions, it's all going to be limited to your point of, uh, of uh, temporal perception. At, at this point, your attention will be only on this very uh, limited um, set of things that, that stimulate you. And that's, that's a little daunting and uh, like, it's hard to accept for, for a second. I, mean, I, I think that's, that's something that I'm, that I'm trying to work recently uh, between those big dreams and understanding that even in our short life, I'm 30 something, I cannot collect myself knowing that there were thousands of my personalities already dead and all of them immensely interesting to me and they, they completely dead and those ideas, those strives, those actions are completely lost and those moments of attention, they, they fade away forever and uh, that's probably the, the fate for, for the future too. I, when, I, when I hear that and you, Colton, um, I, I feel like I'm some sort of tiny animal on a side of a cliff face, kind of like right on the edge, like a snake kind of slithering along an edge and there's a lot of wind and maybe a little hail. And, and it's just this, this feeling like going down my right leg and that was just what I kept feeling when I heard you talking about this edge between what you are and what your dreams are in a way. Hmm. I have this, uh, this energetic sense of uh, us all being different shapes of knots. And then mm -hmm. as we look at each other, the knots start to untangle in various ways and we share bits of our knots and then uh, like the, the knots travel through the different people to the places where they are resolved and then the resolution travels back. So when you said the word knot, uh, I was thinking N-O-T knot and not K-N-O-T knot. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and the negation struck me so much more deeply as as we are all just these these knots that, uh -huh. that exist. <laughs> and, and we, we are what we are not, um, mm -hmm. and that is the thing that defines us. And that just like struck me to my core. So like something really resounded in me when you said that. And, and then it made me giggle when I realized like, that's not what you were talking about at all. Um, so. I think that was beautiful. <laughs> but I think that that is really poignant because I feel like that becomes so much of our identity, even maybe more than the things that we are. Like Danica was saying about her list, she was focusing on the things that she hadn't done, or like Ray was saying, the way that a lot of our identities have been formed by being denied access to things or communities because of the way that we are not. Like it from my background is in <laughs> is in racial studies and there's a big point in, in the United States and there's a big point that these sort of minority monolithic identities only come about that there's only solidarity between people of a similar race which is the social of this nation because of the ways 
they are not like the majority in the ways in which they're denied access to community and resources in a very specific way. So, good point, Colton. <laughs> well said. Good misinterpretation of Elliot's sentence. Yeah. yeah. I notice some sort of anger in myself whenever I consider race. I think um, some sort of distaste for what Raymond the say subject. Is, as the black person in the room of white people, uh -huh. I feel. Yes. <laughs> I think uh, it's like it's like when. Um, COVID started and everyone was talking about COVID, there's like a part of me that gets annoyed hearing about it. And I think because of what's in the air, I somehow got annoyed at that, uh, which I find interesting now that there was that reaction in me. Do you feel comfortable sharing what was annoying about it? I, I think it's, it's rooted in some sort of fear that, fear that like my, fear that all the people I love will be taken over by some sort of giant mimetic being that is beyond me that I can never Overcome? Yeah. We sort of already live within giant mimetic structures. Yes. Like, like I was born He's very into, angry about it all the time. Well, I was born into a country, <laughs> yeah, I was born into a various religion, I was born into a culture, and here I am going, oh god, this is how I was, the, the like, the machinery that I'm working on is built on a machinery that is so entrenched that I don't even know I'm using it. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to have like improved interrelational experience with myself and every part of the system that I ever meet. But actually, it's this hugely integrated monolith. <laughs> like, I feel like an ant fighting like a tidal wave. Like, <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> wow. mm. And maybe the part of the annoyance is noticing that I am trying to fight it and then wondering why I would try to fight myself mm -hmm. in that way if, like, I am partly that, or I am that. I'm a manifestation of it, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just... Uh... <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's right, Colton. Yeah, go ahead. No, yeah, you yeah, first. <laughs> I was going to ask if that comes back to the not like feeling like you the the meme that is you feel sometimes it's taking over your loved ones or that they might choose over you is excluding you or like you're not a part of it or it's somehow in opposition to you it's a threat yeah that feeling is definitely there like it's a threat to me In what yeah. specific um, way was COVID a threat to you? Oops, sorry. Did you no. say Kool-Aid? Yes, Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid man, how is he threatening you? COVID. Uh, oh, COVID. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, for instance, when I was, when we were coming back and mm, the people in this place that I currently lived in, that I love, and did not want me to come back. Yeah. And, and then later on when we were separated for two weeks, like that, the, yeah. And then noticing that people are going to protests now, same, and I feel like that kind of switch, the dramatic switch between trying to enforce isolation because the, that mimetic base wants to enforce isolation at that time, but then the moment it switches to wanting to protest, then you switch to 
that which is a con contradiction of what was claimed in the first place or the, the reasons for isolating in the first place. Right. Very well said. People struggling with meaning and they find meaning in something very outside of themselves or community and I think you try to bring to community the value of community and a lot of people still find abstract values way stronger like fight for particular types of justice and there is there is hard to argue on the level of this pointed attention of, of each person what's what's actually more meaningful to them so i think you you experience from from the broader community those uh, incompatibilities of local values and global values it yeah i have that perception where that narrative tends to find its way in me repeatedly. I feel like now might be a good time to wrap up um, this recording. Thank you all for your participation. I've appreciated the flavor of each of you in being here and exploring with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.